Hi, welcome to a series I'm calling Reading Literature, an Introduction. This is a series where I'm going to try to uh, provide an introduction to uh, the practice, the art of reading great works of literature, classic literature, uh, the famous novels and plays and other works of the centuries. Um, my target audience here is the type of person who uh, is intelligent, educated, um, but doesn't do a lot of reading in literature in their spare time. Uh, the type of person maybe who enjoyed reading plays and novels in, in middle school or high school, maybe took a class or two in college, but since then kind of hasn't read a lot in the classics. Uh, the kind of person who I think, uh, I think a lot of people can relate to this, uh, finds himself saying or thinking from time to time, man, I should really read uh, some more Shakespeare or... Uh, oh, yes, that, that great, uh, famous novel. I, I really ought to read that. I really am interested in that, but I just never seem to get around to it. Um, I think that this is a common experience that a lot of people have. I, I have that experience not with literature, but with other arts like music. Um, and I think it's, it's an understandable experience to have to feel like you are interested in it and you want to do it, but you can't quite get the motivation to get into it and make it a regular part of your life. Uh, because I think that things like literature can be overwhelming. There's a lot of books out there that are on the list of the, the classics or the great books or the books that everyone should read. And it can be hard to know where to start, what do I need to know before I begin, what are the, going to be some of the challenges and how do I get past them. So in this series, I'm going to use some of my knowledge, education, and experience, which uh, I, I have a bachelor's degree in English, and I'm halfway through a master's degree in the liberal arts. Um, so I'm not like a, a top expert, but I know, a, I know some things about literature, and I'm going to try to use my expertise, uh, my knowledge, to try to give you uh, sort of an introduction to the how to read literature, how to get the most out of the experience. Because I really do believe that reading literature is a valuable experience for anyone and everyone. Um, it, it provides a great deal of pleasure once you understand how to get to that pleasure, even though it can be challenging at first. And it can provide a lot of knowledge about ideas and people. Um, and it's a knowledge and pleasure that somebody can access on any level of time commitment. You don't have to be a literature professor who does nothing but read or somebody who has time to read novel after novel after novel week after week. You can really get the benefits of literature even if you have very little time and you actually aren't able to read a whole lot of things. Uh, I think there's this notion that because there's this you know, these huge list of the essential works to read, that it's like, oh man, if I don't have time to read, you know, the the hundred greatest novels, uh, then what's the point? And I think that that's a an understandable perspective to have, but it but it keeps you away if you don't have all of that spare time from enjoying and getting getting a lot out of the experience of uh, reading what you can read in the time that you do have. Uh, so I want to emphasize that this is something that you can do on any level of time commitment, and you can get this benefit out of any breadth of reading. Now, I think that my goal with this video is to make something that is useful at any time, and will hopefully, if I succeed in, in making it what I hope it to be, make a series that will be useful for people for years to come. However, I also think that this type of series is topical right now, because due to the unfortunate situation with the coronavirus, a lot of people are stuck at home and maybe don't, aren't able to work or have less work and uh, are kind of at a loss for what to do. And um, this, is, this can be a time for those I meant to or I keep wanting to or I really ought to read for you to turn those into reality. And my goal here is to give you uh, some of the knowledge and the motivation to actually take that step and make that a reality. One of the great things about reading literature in this day and age, too, uh, particularly with a mind to the, the lockdown orders and the quarantining and everything that's going on today, is 
that it's something that you can do without leaving the house. And you don't even have to leave the house to go to a bookstore now because uh, there are all sorts of places where you can get classic literature online, often for free. Uh, one such place is Project Gutenberg, which I will put a link to in the description. That has access to pretty much every major work of literature that's in the public domain, so anything that's over about 80 to 100 years old, online for free. You can download it in a bunch of different formats. It makes things really easy, and it makes literature something that you can start diving into even if you are locked in at home uh, due to the pandemic. So before I get into the topic of this video, which is going to be why you should read literature at all, I'll give an overview of the entire series very briefly. So there are three main parts of this series as I see it. Um, the first part I'm going to just go into, and that's today's video, uh, what is literature and why you should read it? What's the point? Because I don't think that you should do anything like this. Just because a lot of people say you should, or uh, it's like the ideal of being well-read, uh, I wouldn't be recommending this at all if I didn't think there were direct personal benefits to your life that you can gain from reading classic literature. So that's going to be the topic today. The next two parts, uh, the second part will deal with um, sort of taking that list of 500 classic books and not literally that list, but taking the whole world of classic literature that's out there that can be overwhelming because there's so much and you you don't necessarily know without being a scholar in the field what what is important, what's less important, what's easy, what's more difficult, what should I read first, what should I read later, what should I be what would I be most interested in? My goal in the second video is going to be to break that down and simplify it. And the third part will be uh, a video where I go over a sequence of techniques that make reading literature easier, less challenging, uh, dealing with common obstacles that can come up like the difficulty of language or the question of what translation should I get if, you, if you're reading a foreign, a foreign work. Um, that's going to be the topic of the third part. So today I want to talk about, as I said, what is literature? What actually am I talking about when I say, oh, you should really read literature? And why should you read it? What is the point? Um, the, this is going to be, you know, to the best of, of my understanding as I think about these issues. Um, and so I'm just going to try to give you my thinking about how I approach literature and how I think uh, people should approach literature and the benefits I think that I get and that I think you can get from literature as well. Uh, so first, I, I want to talk about what it means to be art. Because literature is a type of art. Of course, there are many different types of art. Painting, uh, music, sculpture. Literature is one type of art. So to understand what literature is, we first should understand what art is, and then we'll get more specific on what makes literature different from the other arts. So I think the most important thing to think of when thinking about art is that art is a recreation of reality. A recreation. Note I said recreation, not a reproduction. It's not a carbon copy of something that is out there in the world. That would be like a photograph or a uh, newspaper story uh, that would, or a biography or a history book. Those would be taking something that's real, something that exists or that happened, and producing that directly uh, so that you can learn about the actual real concrete thing. That's not what art is. Art is a recreation of reality. The artist takes things that he sees or she sees and, and experiences out there in the world and then recombines them to create a new world of sorts that is in the artwork. And the important thing to understand about, the next important thing to understand about recreation is that by necessity, just by the nature of how recreating reality works, the artist has to be selective. The artist does not and cannot recreate everything that is out there. Uh, in fact, it's extremely selective. I mean, if you think about a sculpture, say a sculpture of a person, 
That's one person selected in one moment in time. So there's any billions of people and any trillions of moments that the sculptor could choose, but they choose a specific person and a specific moment. And the same is true in literature. Even though literature isn't bound to a specific moment, it is bound, you know, there are a certain number of characters that you can put in a story, and you can't put as many characters as there are people. So the writer selects certain characters, certain attributes of people, certain types of people, and not others. Often, there are a few novels that we could say cover a person's entire life, but those are very few. Most cover only a part of a person's life. So the writer is very selective, chooses only certain people to recreate and certain events, not all people and not all events. Uh, now, why do I make such a big deal about selectivity? Uh, it may seem almost like an obvious point. Yeah, of course, the writer can't do everything. The artist can't do everything. They're only doing some things. Of course, that's true. That's an obvious point. And I think it is sort of an obvious point, but it has some important implications that I think are not obvious, that it took me a while to fully understand the importance of. And what I would emphasize among those implications is that the writer, the writer or the artist, the, particularly those that, are, that we would consider great, very skilled artists, they're not selecting willy-nilly. They're not just picking at random, or even just picking according to whatever they feel like picking at any particular moment. They're actually picking the things that they think are important, uh, that are important in the deepest sense. So when we talk about, say, uh, the sculpture of the David by Michelangelo, that's not just a figure that he chose at random. That's a figure that is chosen based on Michelangelo's deepest convictions about human beings and the potential of human beings. We see that David is sort of an idealized portrait of a, a hero figure standing up against a, a, a dangerous uh, evil. That's something that Michelangelo thought was important to depict. And this is true in all forms of art. We look at literature, that there are certain stories that the author feels are worth telling, that, are, that say important things about the world and about human beings. And other possible stories, the writer could tell any number of stories, but they exclude the other ones because they view those as less important. They don't say things that are as important. So when we see the recreated reality made by the artist, whether it's a sculpture or a painting or a story, we see not a exact reproduction, as I said, of, of our reality, but we see actually what we might call a slanted or a skewed reality. Uh, and I don't mean that in a negative sense. Those terms can, I think, have, an, have a negative sort of ring. But I think that, that that's actually a really good thing because when we see a slanted reality made by an artist, we see certain things included and certain things not included. And the things that are included are precisely the things, when it's a skilled artist, that the artist thinks are most important to have included. So we're seeing the world, when we look at these slanted realities, as another person sees it. And not just any other person when we're reading or appreciating great works of art, but as a person who's really perceptive and has a lot of, uh, a lot of deep thoughts and ideas about the world. So when we look at a work of art, we are seeing reality as seen by somebody who is an, a, a genius, who's seeing things that has a distinct perspective and interesting ideas. So that's a real benefit that we can get from art that we can't get by looking at a photograph or reading a history book. We get into a certain perspective by seeing a slanted reality, the world as the artist sees it. So this brings me to the notion of why art matters, and I'll talk more specifically about literature in just a bit. Uh, well, I've kind of gotten towards some of that benefit. We see a slanted reality through the mind 
of somebody who has some deep thoughts, deep notions about the basic issues of what is the world? How do we understand this world we live in? How do we understand ourselves? How do we understand the other people that we interact with all the time? This is one of the real benefits of art. Uh, it helps us to understand these ideas, these different ways of seeing the world. See, these deep ideas I'm talking about basically are what the study of philosophy is. It's the study of the basic questions of existence and the basic questions about humanity. And from reading philosophy, you might say, oh, well, what, what am I getting from seeing the art that I don't get, wouldn't get from just reading philosophy? I can read philosophy and get other people's perspective on these basic questions, right? Well, so this brings me to, a, the, I think, the key issue in art. Philosophy certainly gives you insight into how different people understand these basic questions of existence and these basic questions about humanity. But philosophy states these ideas in these very abstract statements that are very difficult to comprehend the full meaning of. So, for example, a philosopher might say, human beings are innately evil. Okay, so that's an idea, and you can think about that idea. But what does that actually mean? How does that actually mean in terms of the people I encounter every day? What does it mean in terms of my life and how I should live? And what might be the consequences of the idea that people are innately evil? Those are, it's really difficult to get to those questions just by getting that abstract claim. And what art does is it takes that sort of an abstract claim and it shows you actual concrete reality. It shows you that claim in actual concrete reality. It shows you what that claim actually means in terms of an actual world and actual human beings. So... Art enables us to see these complicated abstract ideas in real, concrete images, stories, scenes, events. And that enables us to have a better understanding of these ideas and uh, to understand the implications of these ideas that are kind of bandied around and maybe people don't take them fully seriously or they don't understand the implications of them, and it can be hard to do that. Uh, art gives us the ability to experience those in a concrete sense. And I'll give you an example of this. Uh, there's a very famous painting that I'll, I will put up uh, called Liberty Leading the People by Eugene Delacroix. Uh, now, this painting is very, a very memorable scene, and it shows uh, this woman who, who is the embodiment of liberty leading this popular uprising of of downtrodden people who are ready to resist the oppression that they've been put under. This painting, I think, is really powerful because, precisely because, it gives us a concrete, visible image that you can look at, remember, even feel like you can almost reach out and touch of a really abstract idea, the idea that it is glorious to fight for freedom against oppression. And I think there's a real difference between somebody simply saying or reading or remembering, we should fight for freedom, versus seeing this image. This image brings that idea, that kind of lofty idea, we should fight for freedom, down to earth and shows you what it means in terms of actual people and events, practical reality. So this is one of the real benefits of art and enables us to experience heady ideas in terms of concrete actual reality, which helps us understand those ideas and how those ideas actually play out in terms of the real world and people's real lives. Uh, and, and we can see through different artists who have different sets of ideas uh, the implication of different views. And that can help us to either get a better understanding of the view that we do agree with or to understand the view of people who we don't agree with. So this is a really important benefit of art. Uh, 
another benefit that I, I don't want to de-emphasize, this is kind of the philosophical, heady, uh, long-term life fulfillment benefit of art. I, I do think it's an important benefit. I do want to say, though, that the number one benefit in art is quite simply enjoyment. We get all of this benefit, and that benefit of understanding philosophical ideas, I think, feeds into our enjoyment. Uh, I think we enjoy that painting all the more because it is showing us something that, that actually might matter to us. But the number one thing is just simply that we enjoy it. And, uh, and that's really something I want to keep emphasizing, that the number one benefit of art is simply that it brings a great deal of enjoyment to your life when you know how to appreciate it. Now, briefly, to turn from art in general to literature in particular. Because I think it's easy to think, okay, I understand the benefit of art. I understand that art can bring all of this pleasure and all of this knowledge and understanding to my life. But let's say I'm already somebody who really likes paintings, and I go to the art museum every month, and I really look at a lot of paintings. Why should I also add literature? when I'm already getting that benefit from paintings or from music or from any number of other art forms. Well, so I think it's really true that each different form of art has distinctive benefits. There are things you can get from painting that you can't get from literature, but there are things you can get from literature that you can't get from painting or music or uh, sculpture or any of the, the other ones. And there are really two that I want to point out that are the distinct benefits in literature. One is that literature, unlike most of the other arts, shows the actions and consequences of human events over a period of time. If you think about painting or sculpture, we get a single moment. And that single moment can be really powerful and can say a lot. But what we don't get is, what different choices do human beings make? What different courses of action can they choose? And what are the consequences of those different courses? How do those courses of action play out over the span of months or years or a lifetime? That's a distinct benefit in literature, where we can follow out different ways of living life, different modes. And this, is, this is, I think, is one of the benefits of literature, especially for young people, although it can benefit everybody in any stage of life, is Young people especially are thinking, there are all of these different paths I can pursue in life, and how do I know which one to choose? Literature can be a way of seeing different paths that one could take, and seeing notions of how those paths would actually play out, according to the views of different, uh, very intelligent, very perceptive writers. The second benefit, after the benefit of seeing action over time, is the benefit of seeing, as great literature can do, intense, in-depth, detailed descriptions of people's innermost thoughts and feelings. Literature is really the only art that can really get you, not just inside the mind of the artist and the way they view the world, but inside the mind of the artist's characters, inside the mind of people who are, say, making difficult decisions in important life life-changing crises or people who are experiencing intense and hard to understand emotions to uh, dramatic life-shaking events literature gives us the means of by describing these thought patterns and emotions out in great detail the means of understanding the way that our own minds and and thoughts and feelings work and also potentially a way of understanding what other people are going through in, in other situations. It's often said that literature uh, helps us feel empathy for other people. And I think this is why, because we can see how those other people work through these in-depth descriptions that writers give to us. So this is another great benefit of literature that doesn't exist so much in the other arts. We can understand ourselves and others in a great degree of depth by getting this sort of detailed description of the way that our minds and other people's minds work. Finally, before I wrap up here, I, I want to resolve an issue that might come to mind, which is, what do you mean by literature? Do you mean just 
any fiction? Uh, or do you mean something much more specific, more rarefied, more ivory tower? Well, uh, I do mean something other than just fiction in general. I don't want to denigrate popular, so-called popular fiction, uh, because I think that some of these benefits do exist in popular fiction, especially popular fiction that's fairly well done. I think that the certain benefits in terms of seeing ideas and seeing the way that people act and, and, and the way that people think exist in all well-done works of fiction. However, I think that literature, when we talk about great literature or classic literature, offers some deeper insights than popular fiction. And the main difference I would say for, between literature and popular fiction and I, contrary to the kind of the popular term, the widely used term, I don't mean it's a distinction between popular fiction is very popular, many people read it and like it, and literature is something that only a few people know and read. I mean that literature, the distinction between literature and popular fiction, as I would put it, is that literature deals with more philosophical ideas than popular fiction. And by that, I, I mean that the, the ideas that the writer of literature is expressing in their created world are ideas that are more difficult, more wide-ranging, harder to grasp than ideas that the popular fiction writer is dealing with. And... One, uh, one example that we could give for this is the most popular, well-known work of popular fiction in the, in the past you know, 50 years or so, I guess, is, is probably Harry Potter. That's a very, very widely read, well-known series that a lot of people really love. And I think that there, there is a lot to love in Harry Potter. It's a very well-done work of popular fiction. But let's think about the ideas that are uh, being expressed in Harry Potter. The main idea that we get throughout that whole series uh, is that love conquers hate. Love is better than hate. Love is stronger than hate. We have our heroes who are uh, empowered and saved by their ability to love and be loved, and the villains are un incapable of love. They only know hate, and that's what makes them so bad, and that's what brings them down. That's a good idea. That's a good theme for popular fiction. But I think it's it's only working at a certain level of depth. That's a I mean it's I think a true idea that love is stronger than hate. But I think it's also sort of an idea that a, a lot of people have had, a lot of people have written about, a lot of people have thought about, and that I think is it's it's operating at a certain level, but it's not at the highest level that one can go in terms of the ideas that that you're writing about. Uh, and, and the contrast counterexample I'll put is, is Frankenstein, the, the novel by Mary Shelley, not the, uh, the various film adaptations. Frankenstein is about the, the dangers of thoughtless science, the dangers of going on these voyages of discovery without thinking about the consequences. And it's about thinking, uh, Frankenstein is also about what it means to be in the deepest sense a complete outcast from the entire human species and how one deals with the situation of being just by one's own nature reviled by all and outcast from society. Those themes are just working on somewhat of a deeper level than the ones in Harry Potter. And so I think that there's a benefit that you can get from reading Frankenstein and other books like it that you wouldn't necessarily get from reading Harry Potter. Again, I don't say this to say throw all your popular novels in the trash, never read them again, read only classics from now until the, the day you die. I'm not saying that. There is a real benefit to just reading stuff that you enjoy, and I don't, I don't discourage you at all from doing that. What I am saying is something like this. In reading popular fiction, kind of like watching popular kind of blockbuster movies, there's an, there can be an immediate pleasure that is very real and is genuinely enjoyable. But in reading literature, the great, the classic works of literature, those might be actually not pleasurable at first. They can be frustrating at first. But there's a deeper pleasure and a deeper intellectual benefit that comes from those who 
do put in the work to achieve that deeper level of understanding. That at least is my experience, and, and that's what I'm hoping to enable others to achieve through this series. So that about wraps up what I had wanted to say in this video. Uh, I, I hope that this has given you some insight into uh, understanding why literature is something that you might want to add to your life. Um, I, I do want to say um, I, I always like to give credit when I, when I use ideas that uh, I've learned from other people. Uh, this book, uh, The Romantic Manifesto by Ayn Rand, is, the, uh, is I think, the great work on art. Um, many people, I think, have heard of Ayn Rand in connection with her political ideas, but she has ideas on a lot of subjects. She wrote a number of novels herself. She analyzed a lot of other people's novels. And I think she has a theory of art, which I kind of gave the short version of my understanding of it today, that can really get to why human beings need art at all. So I definitely recommend that work. And also the other big, uh, big teacher in my understanding of literature is Lisa Van Dam, who runs a private school in California, and she runs an online book group called Read With Me, and I'll put a link to that in the description. Uh, which I think is a really good resource for people who are uh, not like super versed in literature but want to learn and maybe don't have a lot of time. That book club that she runs is a really good way to get into things. So uh, having given credit to uh, those inspirations in, in my life um, and my understanding of this subject, um, I think I will wrap it up here. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, the next video in the series, which hopefully I will post in a uh, short while from this, we'll begin to start getting specific and start breaking down this world of hundreds or thousands of works and making it simpler for us to understand what's out there and how do you approach it. Uh, thanks again. If you enjoyed this video or got something out of it, I hope that you will uh, like it and subscribe to my channel. And if you really, really, really liked it, uh, I would be very appreciative if you could share it with other people. Uh, thank you so much. I will see you next time.